Welcome to session five of Living by Faith Today, based on Hebrews chapter 11. Quick recap, you know, we started in Habakkuk, way back in that little book of Habakkuk, and we looked at the phrase, the just shall live by faith, and what God meant by that. And what he taught Habakkuk is the same thing that he's teaching the Hebrews, and hopefully us. And that is that in the midst of difficult circumstances, in the midst of all the facts that we can see that seem contrary to God and his word, we focus on the unseen truth of God and we respond obediently to that. And God says, that's faith. And every time that we read an example in Hebrews chapter 11, we're looking at that another facet of that faith. It's like God's shining through Faith, what he wants to see in us when he looks for faith is in this beautiful room surrounded by windows on every side. And it's every example we read, it's like raising a shade on that one window and we see faith from that angle. And we're going to learn something about God-pleasing faith from every life. Today, it's Noah. Noah is a fascinating case. You will find... Um, Noah mentioned in the Bible at least in one, two, three, four, five places, and maybe more. I might have missed some. And they're all significant and they all teach us something. I won't be reading all of them because some of them are very long. For example, we start in Genesis chapter 6 and the story of Noah and the ark and all that happened to Noah we um, will find in chapters 6 through 9. Well, that's way too much for us to read this morning. So I want to encourage you this week, at some point when you're done with this study, to read about Noah. Even if it's a story with which you are familiar, reread the story of Noah because everything that he says in Hebrews and that I'm going to say today is based on the story of Noah and the ark. We do read in Genesis 6, chapter 6, that in the midst of an extremely wicked, perverse, hateful, horrible world, Noah found favor with God, that Noah was a righteous man at a time when it was extremely difficult to be righteous, and God favored him. In Ezekiel 14, verses 14 and 20, we read that, ah, it's interesting. God is talking about coming judgment on Jerusalem for Jerusalem's horrendous sins over time. And he says that the cup of my wrath is so full with you guys by now that even if Noah were still alive or Daniel or Job, he singles out those three men from the Old Testament. He said, even if it was Noah himself, he would only save himself. He wouldn't be able to take anybody with him because everybody's wicked. But it's interesting, Noah is used as an example of saving faith. And we'll have more on that later. Then 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, he's called a preacher of righteousness. And we're going to be looking at those verses more later. But for right now, just laying a base of who this Noah was, during a horribly wicked world, not only did he obey God, but he preached righteousness somehow to all these disbelieving, cruel, persecuting, and ridiculing people that lived around him, he preached God to them. And God was pleased with that, of course. And then we have Matthew 24, 39, and Luke 17, 27. In both of those references, it talks about how the world was completely ignored, Noah's message, and how the destruction came on them suddenly. They weren't expecting it, not because they hadn't been told, but because they had rejected God and his word so thoroughly. And it's likened to the second coming of Christ. And again, just the eternal destruction of those outside of Christ and the salvation of those in Christ. And it said it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. So again, we learn about Noah's faith here that he persevered in living and preaching righteousness or the word of God, the character of God, a heart relationship with God in the midst of a very perverse generation. Then Hebrews eleven seven, and that's our main text for today. 
we're just going to read that verse and make sure we understand what it's saying about Noah's faith. And we're going to reinforce that from the Peter verses. And that'll be it for today because, <clears throat> excuse me, these verses cover these immense topics like eternal damnation, eternal salvation, baptism. Um, it, it, but we can't go there because I'm not teaching on Second Peter or First Peter. I'm not teaching on Genesis and I'm not teaching on the themes of those wonderful subjects. I'm teaching on faith. So we're going to read these verses and pick out what they teach us about a God-pleasing faith. Okay, Hebrews 11, verse 7. God is giving examples of what he means when he uses the word faith. It says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. All right, one short verse, and oh my goodness, is there ever a lot there? Let's just look at it. It says that by faith, Noah built the ark. That seems so simple on the surface, but let's take a look at it. God warned Noah, according to this verse, and if you read Genesis chap chapter 6 through 9, you'll see that God told Noah everything. He told Noah everything he was thinking and feeling and what his plans were for the entire world and how he was going to save Noah and Noah's family and what Noah had to do. It's all right there. So God warned him explicitly and made sure that Noah understood it. Fascinating story. Even if you think you, it's familiar to you, go back and reread it. So... Noah responded obediently to what God said, even though it was unseen. He believed in God already. God had, had already said, I, this man has found favor with me. He loves me. He obeys me. He preaches about me. But God said, now I need his response of mature, strong faith for something very important. So again, belief and faith are not portrayed as exactly the same thing. What was the belief from which Noah started? The belief was that God is who he says he is, God has done what he says he has done, and God will do what he says he will do. Noah believed God. And he acted on that belief, and that's where his faith began to be exhibited and to grow. It says that he focused on the unseen truth of God. That's going to be evident in almost every example we read. This learning to see the invisible truth of God and responding to that, not to the facts that crowd around us every day that we can see and touch and feel and, and react to. We can react to the facts. We are to respond in faith to the truth. It's a, it's a very important distinction, and it says that Noah did that, the unseen. Um, it says, in reverent fear, therefore, he constructed the ark. In reverent fear is one word in the um, Greek, and it means with extreme caution. It means he proceeded to build the ark with extreme care and caution. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that he did it, he was afraid to offend his neighbors? He was real careful about that as he built the ark? No, it means he was, what he was careful about was to obey every detail God had given him because he believed in the unseen reality of the consequences of disobedience. And he was more afraid to disobey than he was to obey because obeying was difficult. Everyone around him disbelieved, ridiculed him. They didn't even know what rain was yet. There hadn't been any rain on the earth. It, it was, and he built this immense ship. <laughs> but disobeying God seemed more scary to him than obeying and building that ark. That is such an important component 
of faith, learning to fear God properly, to be more afraid to disobey than afraid to obey. Because obeying can sometimes be scary. Stepping out in faith can sometimes be scary. Oh my goodness, lots of stories about that. Some will tell, some we won't. Um, but if for that faith to be strong and that faith to persevere and for that faith to step out on unseen realities, we have to fear disobeying more than we fear obeying. That's one thing we learn from Noah's faith. And then this business about by this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. That's huge and we're going to look at that at the very end. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit more about fearing the Lord. You know, faith doesn't fear. We can respond to what happens in life in two ways, with fear or with faith, but not both. They don't coexist. And so we learn to not fear as long as we're fearing God. <laughs> and we fear disobeying more than we fear what we're facing. Um, my favorite verse about fearing God is Isaiah 8, 13 through 15 in the Living Bible. It just, to me, it says it all. It says, don't fear anything except the Lord of the armies of heaven. If you fear God, you need fear nothing else. When I first read that, it really impressed me uh, because there were some things I was kind of afraid of, you know, afraid of what's happening with this coronavirus and our plans. We have plans and we were just not being able to carry them through this year. I'd love to be visiting my parents right now. Can't. The facility where they live won't allow it, much less everything involved in traveling. I have fears that, that I won't see them again in this life. I have fears for my children, for my grandchildren. I have fears for our church. I have fears about our health. Um, these are, you know, potentially real facts that we are grappling with. But it struck me, if I am properly fearing God, careful to obey him no matter what, I don't have to fear any of this because he's going to work it all out. He takes it on all of it, all of it, as his responsibility. I read a verse the other day that says, when you're trusting the Lord, he will smooth out the road in front of you. So I don't have to fear any of it. Not the coronavirus. God will do what God will do. I don't have to fear what's going to happen to my parents. It's going to be for the best for them and for us, whatever it is. The same with my children, my grandchildren, and our church. We just put our best foot forward for the Lord each day, and I... I trust him to work out all the rest, all the details. So if I fear God, I need not fear anything else. That's a powerful verse and I love it. You know, I think I'm gonna give you an example from my own life and you who are from Calvary will have heard this example many times and I apologize for repeating it, but it's it kind of is perfect right here. Um, our human fathers are supposed to teach us what God is like. And I had a dad who did a good job with that. And it taught me the right kind of fear, I think, to have for God. I had a daddy. He, we called him daddy for many years. He played with us. He told us stories. He taught us from the Bible. He, he was just great. He really was. Not perfect, but a wonderful dad. But I learned early on not to disobey him. <laughs> consequences would follow, and those consequences stung quite a lot. And that kept me from sin more times than I can count. Not some kind of mushy emotional love, and it's the same with God. You know, I, I, I'm afraid to sin. I have an, a relationship with the Lord, like with my dad. He's my daddy. I, I feel surrounded by his arms, protected by his love, and forgiven by his grace. But I don't dare cross him or be disrespectful to him 
or disobey him because I believe in the consequences of that. If not eternally, at least for this life, he'd have to discipline me for that <laughs> and discipline stings. So that's the kind of fear we see in faith. We, we fear disobeying more than we fear obeying. That's so key. Um, so up until now, just from Noah, we have learned that faith heeded God's warning. Faith focused on the unseen and responded obediently to that in the midst of difficult circumstances. Uh, what do I mean by circumstances? Well, think for a minute of this life. <laughs> Not everything goes according to plan A. Not Doors don't always just fling open before us. Sometimes they do, but they don't always. Um, for example, one clear example that I've given before, in fact, I gave it just a couple weeks ago, but it's easy to understand, is the circumstances that surround tithing. Sometimes if money is tight, um, it's tempting to look at that circumstance and say, I better not tithe. I'd better keep all my money this month. God will understand. And we are therefore responding to the seen circumstance rather than to God's eternal truth, which says, please tithe. I will bless it. You'll be okay. Trust me with it. Um, we can understand that, but sometimes leading isn't as clear as that in God's word. Let me give you some examples. We were um, living and working in Aguascalientes, Mexico, had been there for many years, had a good solid church there, um, raised our kids there, and one day God told both Dan and me that it was time to move on. We had someone to take our place and we needed to establish that person and then get out of the way and go someplace new. And, oh my goodness, um, okay. <laughs> so we began to unplug and we gave notice for our rent. We packed everything up. We, you know, we did everything that we could do. We installed a new pastor, everything. One little glitch was that we didn't have any place to go. God had not yet told us what to do or where to go. And some people might say, well, it was irresponsible. You should have waited. But you know, when God speaks, you can't wait. Um, we started taking day trips, visiting other areas of Mexico to find where was God calling us. And in that way, we visited a little town up in the mountains called Jerez and knew immediately as soon as our feet touched soil that God was calling us to Jerez. But we would not have gone there at all had we not been in that position. So, you know, and God taught us many lessons through that example of uh, responding to an unseen truth when the circumstances made no sense. Uh, then there's going to the mission field in the first place. When God called us to Ecuador, when we were newlyweds, we had no money to speak of. We really didn't. Um, no experience, that's for sure. And yet God said, go. Go to Ecuador. Said, oh, my goodness. So, oh, and by the way, I was pregnant. So we did. And we had quite the adventure getting there, not to mention the four years we lived there. But we never doubted for one minute that God had called us. And we were surrounded by naysayers, by people who said, you're being foolish, you're being brash. You have to wait until you have more money. You have to wait until you have more experience. You have to wait until your baby is born, um, on and on. And yet in our hearts and in our minds, we knew God had spoken to us. And not our parents, by the way, they, all four of them supported us from day one but just about everybody else thought we were nuts. <laughs> and we had to politely turn a deaf ear to all of that and just obey God and all oh, the blessings and the life that has flowed from that. Um, leaving the mission field just in 2008, after, I don't know what, 30 years on the foreign mission field, that was another one. We were just up here on vacation with one suitcase apiece. 
when God called us to stay to take care of my husband's parents. And that was not an easy decision to make. And again, the circumstances were, were not good. We had no job here. We would lose our salary. We had a busy life and work in Jerez, Mexico that we felt was dependent on us. Um, and on and on and on. We had no place to live. Anyway, God clearly, and that's a story for another day how that all worked, but God clearly revealed to my husband and to me that he was calling us to stay. We never went back. We're still here. In a half an hour, God had called our children living in Jerez, had called our co-workers in Jerez, and had called the mission board in Minneapolis and resigned. And in 30 minutes, we had a brand new life. It was a little head-blowing, but we had to respond to what God said. And again, we've never looked back. We have perfect peace that that was what God wanted from us. So all I'm doing with these illustrations is showing you um, that you can't go by circumstances. You can't wait until everything seems to line up absolutely perfectly, things are going your way. And then what do you need faith for? <laughs> what do you need the Lord for at all? Sometimes you just have to launch out on faith and we're gonna see that in several of these examples. And today Noah just obeyed God and built that ark when there was absolutely no known reason to do so. Quite the opposite. At the end of Hebrews 11 verse 7 it says, and by this, by the constructing of this ark, uh, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. We're going to look at that. We're going to see what does that mean. I'm going to read from First and Second Peter, Second Peter two four through nine. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if He did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, who was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. There's a lot there it's tempting to teach on, but I'm not going to. We're only going to look at one facet of Noah's faith. And then reading from 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. And baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, boy, there's a lot there, isn't there? We're not going to teach on any of that. What I want you to see from the three verses that I read or the three passages I read is that God used Noah's faithful response to his unseen message of truth as a symbol, as a, a teaching point, as an example of condemn, eternal condemnation, eternal salvation, and the role of baptism. That's huge. That's huge. Where would we be if Noah had not obeyed, if he hadn't responded, if he would have looked at his circumstances and said, that's nuts, I must have had a bad dream. <laughs> you know, that's just nuts. God wouldn't, God wouldn't ask me to do something that crazy. Uh, remember, God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And sometimes it seems a little nuts. <laughs> anyway, he did obey. And God says, that's faith. That's a lifestyle of faith that I want. And because he was faithful to God and the unseen word, God was able to use his examples through all of life on this planet. Every generation that has lived can look at the story of Noah 
and Noah's Ark and the flood and understand condemnation, eternal condemnation, salvation, uh, and, and that Jesus only saves. That's amazing and that's huge that his faith was used in that way and is still being used today. Did you know that tradition, you probably do know this, that traditional churches, since they first started building them in this country, have been shaped like arcs, a rectangle building with a steep roof. That's, you can see it in your mind. That's kind of the traditional, what has become old fashioned church, but it was built like that for a reason, so that it would look like an inverted arc to symbolize when you come in here, you're coming into Christ and you are saved. It's a wonderful thing. What I wanna pull from all of that is not a teaching on salvation today or baptism, but I want to show you how your faith, when you respond obediently to God's word, regardless of circumstances, with a deaf ear to the naysayers, God takes that and he uses it for something eternally significant. Always, not just Noah, because we're given Noah's example for our lives today. That's why it's in the Bible. Uh, so I want you to, to rest in that and, and take courage from that. In fact, there's a verse, I didn't look it up, in the Living Bible that says, those of you who are trusting in the Lord, cheer up. <laughs> take courage and cheer up. God will reward that faith. He'll reward it in this life, he promises to do so, and he'll reward it in the next life in magnificent ways. And beyond that, he's using it to put his divine plan forward. Every little response of faith that you or I make in, the, in a day or in a week is another puzzle piece that God puts into his, the picture he's making of, of life for whatever reason. We'll understand it in heaven, but it matters. And it gives life a wonderful sense of purpose. Um, so this week, I want you to, you who are trusting in the Lord, take courage and cheer up. God will reward your faith, this life and the next, and he will use it for some eternal glorious purpose. Next week, we're going to look at faith through the window of Abraham. So until then, bye.